see you. Today we're going to be reading about electricity. We're just going to read some sections from this book and learn a little bit about electricity. We're going to start here with section 4. Electricity is used to do work. It is difficult to realize today how much electricity has changed our ways of doing work. Our great-grandparents never had ice cubes frozen by power from an electric refrigerator, nor did they ride downtown on an electric train. They did not mix food with electric mixers or work in factories clean and free from smoke and noise. The electromagnet is the essential part of electric machines. A permanent magnet is not capable of doing much work, for in order to use it, we must move the magnet and then pull it loose from the material it has attracted. An electromagnet, on the other hand, can be constantly supplied with energy capable of doing work. If a pile of mixed iron and copper scrap is to be sorted, an electromagnet may be swung above it and the current turned on. The iron, with some copper material tangled into it, is picked up. This material may be dropped to loosen the copper, picked up again, and transferred to a truck simply by controlling switches. Whenever you see a machine using electricity to do work, try to find how the electromagnet is employed. It is there. The doorbell does work. A very simple device which is based upon the use of the electromagnet is the doorbell. You can understand how it works by studying the diagram as you read. The current flows through a wire into the coils of the electromagnet. From the electromagnet, it flows to a contact point. There. This point is insulated from the frame. On the clapper is another contact point on a little spring. Oh, right here. Here's a little spring. And there's the contact point right there. So you have a clapper, the contact point, the armature. Here's the coil. The little springs are the coals, and here's the bell up here. So this is the doorbell, and you have these wires right here. Let's see. The point of da -da -da. Where did I come to? The current flows through a wire into the coals of the electromagnet. The electromagnet. Da -da -da. Okay. The current flows from one point to the other, down the clapper, and into the frame of the doorbell to the connecting screw. The contact points are pressed together by a spring on the base of the clapper. There's the clapper. When the current flows through the coals, the electromagnet pulls on the armature, uh, which is a bar of iron made to be pulled by the electromagnet. The, this pulls the clapper toward the magnets and breaks the contact, which turns off the current. The electromagnet is stronger than the spring. When the current is turned off, the coals lose their magnetism and the spring pulls the clapper back. This makes contact at the contact this makes a contact at the contact points and the current again magnetizes the coals. All the time this is going on, the end of the clapper strikes the bell every time the, the electromagnet pulls on it. The same principle is used in some electric razors, but the magnet vibrates a little clipper instead of a bell clapper. And here's a little electric motor right here. Check that out. You can make a motor which will work as shown in this photograph. The materials are doorbell wire, bolts, strips from a tin can, a cork, a piece of steel wire or a needle, cells, screws, and a board. A little motor. The electric motor does much work. The electric motor contains two sets of electromagnets. One set has its poles arranged in a circle, and the other set of electromagnets is inside the circle made by the first. The outer magnets are called the field magnets and produce a magnetic field. The inner magnets are called the rotor or armature and they rotate as they are repelled and attracted by the field magnets. Simple motors do not have this circular form but consist of a simple electromagnet on a shaft held between the poles of a horseshoe electromagnet. Such little motors are fun to study but they are inefficient or wasteful of energy because their magnetic fields are too spread out. 
The current is led into the rotor by brushes and metal rings. These are exactly like the brushes and rings of a dynamo. In fact, many dynamos or generators can be used as motors for the parts are almost exactly the same. The motor works by poles of the field magnet attracting the poles of the rotor magnet. This attraction is strongest when the lines of force are almost at right angles to each other and at least when the lines of force are almost in parallel lines. Notice, if you have a simple motor, that the motor starts best with the poles of the rotor turned across the space between the field magnet poles. In order to keep the pull of these magnets on each other as great as possible, the brushes and contacts, the, the, commutator, the co commutator of a direct current motor, are arranged to change the flow of current as the rotor turns. At each half turn on a two-pole rotor, the direction of the current is changed so that like poles are always repelling and unlike poles are always attracting each other as the rotor turns. The differences between a motor and dynamo are important. The dynamo changes mechanical in energy to electrical energy and must have an outside source to provide power. The motor provides power by changing electrical energy to mechanical energy. Motors are used in so many places that there is not room to list them. That is something you can enjoy doing wherever you happen to observe motors in use. As a demonstration, how do the doorbell and motor work? For an apparatus, you need doorbell, a doorbell, dry cells, connectors, direct current motors, and a compass. And then you have directions for this. Connect the doorbell and operate it. Examine the circuit with the cover of the electromagnets removed. Note the spark at the contact points. Set up the demonstration motor. First, wire the field magnets and the rotor in parallel if possible. That is, make the current flow to both from the same posts of the dry cells. Operate the motor as set up. Disconnect the motor and wire the rotor and field magnets in series and again operate it. The rotor is made up of coils of wire connected to the commu commutator in such a way that the north and south poles are always located halfway around the poles of the field magnets. You can see that here. Appears the brush and the rotor. The com commutator is here and the wires right there. The field magnet is up here, and then here you have the iron frame. Okay, here's another part of your little test. Examine the brushes, the commutator, and the general construction of the motor. Test the poles of the magnets with a compass. Observations. Describe what happened during the experiment. If you can, make a simple sketch of the doorbell. Conclusions, how does electromagnetism work? Down here in section 5 we have this. Electricity can be used to produce heat. You may be somewhat puzzled as to how to explain what happens to electricity if energy cannot be created or destroyed. When you close a switch, electricity flows through the wires and is gone. Where is it? Electrical energy can be changed to heat. All of the energy which flows through wires is eventually changed to heat, and the heat passes out into space and is lost. But in the meantime, we may make use of a large amount of this heat before it escapes. Two factors are necessary to produce heat from electricity, a current and resistance. The energy is in the current. When this energy encounters resistance, heat is produced. The amount of heat is in proportion to the current squared. That is, if the amount of current is doubled, the heat is increased four times. Two squared equals four. The heat is also in proportion to the resistance. When more resistance is put into a circuit, both the current and the amount of heat released from the current are reduced. When resistance is taken from a circuit, a larger current is permitted to flow and more heat is produced in the circuit. Remember that a short circuit may produce so much heat that the wires may melt. Many heating devices contain resistance wire. 
When we plug an iron into the outlet, we want the heat to be set free in the iron and as little as possible in the cord. For that reason, we use wire with higher resistance in the iron than in the cord. The most heat is produced at that part of a series circuit where the resistance is highest. A conducting cable, which is safe for many uses, consists of two twisted strands of copper wire insulated and protected by rubber, braided cloth, heavy tape, metal, more tape, and outer braided cloth, which is waterproofed. But because irons, toasters, percolators, and other heating devices must produce fairly large amounts of heat, their resistance must be kept fairly low. This is done by using nichrome wire coils in order to let through enough current. An average, size, an average sized electric iron uses 600 watts of current, much more than the average lamp uses. Such an iron uses a current of about 5.5 amperes and has a resistance of about 20 ohms. A 100 watt lamp uses a current of about 0.9 amperes and has a resistance of about 120 ohms. Do the necessary arithmetic to show that this is true. Thus, we see that an iron is a better heating device than a lamp because it uses more current, not because it has higher resistance. All electrical heating devices used in the home contain some kind of resistance wire. The wire of the toaster is exposed so that we can see how it works. The wires of the electric iron are inside the iron. They are wrapped around a sheet of mica and are insulated by asbestos so that the current will not flow out into the iron. The heat passes from the hot wire to the heavy bottom or shoe of the iron. Most other heating devices, stoves, waffle irons, curling irons, percolator, percolators, are like the iron in general construction. We shall study the Mazda lamp later. Fuses are heating devices. Fuses protect circuits and electrical devices from an overload of electricity. The common house fuse is a little wire in a case shaped like a screw-in plug. It is put into the circuit, usually at the main switch, in a grounded metal box. A grounded connection takes escaping electricity harmlessly to the ground through a cable. The fuse wire is made rather small so that it will carry only a small current without melting. When a larger current flows through it, it becomes hot and melts. This interrupts the circuit and protects the wires and equipment in the house from becoming overheated. Welding is done by electricity. A common method of joining metals is by welding. Welding is a process of melting materials until they flow together so that when the metals cool, they have become, they have become one piece. Sections of ships, bicycle frames, chicken wire, and in fact many other metal devices made of more than one piece are welded. This diagram shows how current is led into the house by the line wires, through the meter, and through fuses to five different circuits in the house. So you have your meter right here. Here are the line wires up here. They come down to this section. This is the cutout switch. And they come up to here. You have your first circuit, second circuit, third circuit, fourth circuit, and the fifth circuit. And this is the distributing and fuse blocks. The, the distributing and fuse block. The electric furnace produces, oops, sorry. In electric welding, an electrode, a conductor, is pressed firmly against each, each piece of metal to be joined. The poor contact between the pieces of metal offers resistance and produces heat, which melts the metal. The electric furnace produces high temperatures. The highest temperatures produced by man are in the electric furnace. One type of furnace has an arc in it. An arc is a gap in a circuit in which there is a very hot vapor. The simplest arc is made with two carbon rods, putting some kinds of resistance in the circuit in series with the rods to protect the circuit. When the ends of the carbons are held together, the carbon vaporizes. Then the carbons are slowly pulled apart, and the current flows through the vapor, making a brilliant light. 
These rods must not be touched with the hands because both serious shocks and burns are possible. Yellow glasses should be used to protect the eyes. In this, in this electric arc furnace, the material to be heated may be put directly into the flaming vapor. In another kind of electric furnace, a current, is, a current is run through the materials to be melted, and the materials themselves offer the resistance. Pig iron is often melted for making steel in such a furnace. Two carbon electrodes enter the top of the furnace and come into contact with the iron. These carbon electrodes do not melt to any great extent in the melted iron as copper or other metals would. The electric arc furnace is commonly used for melting metals. Where does it obtain the relatively low resistance necessary to produce so much heat? Circuits must be designed to conserve energy. Certain methods are useful to reduce the resistance in circuits and to prevent changing electrical energy to heat. A large wire will heat less than a small one, for large wires offer less resistance. A short wire has less resistance than a longer one. The ideal way to save energy would be to have the, cir the current used near the power plant and carried through short, thick wires to the place of use, but this is often not possible. Heat losses can be reduced by increasing the voltage and reducing the amperage of the current. For example, the same number of watts of power can be carried in the form of 10 amperes at 22,000 volts or 2,000 amperes at 110 volts. Watts equal volts times amperes. The 2,000 ampere current would waste a great deal more current as heat than the 10 ampere current would. Now this diagram represents the essential devices and changes in electric current from the dynamo to your house. Here we have the alternating current dynamo, the setup transformer, 2200 volts, a step-down transformer, lamps at 110 volts, and another step-down step transformer to 6 volts for the doorbell. In order to change voltages and currents in this way, transformers are used. A transformer consists of a ring of iron and two coils of wire wrapped on the ring. There are more turns in one coil than in the other. If an alternating current flows in one coil, a magnetic field constantly races back and forth through the iron ring. This magnetic field cutting through the second coil produces a current in it. The voltage of the current is in proportion to the number of turns of wire in the two coils. To step up voltage from 110 to 22,000 volts would require 200 times as many turns of wire in the high voltage coil as in the other. The voltage, is, the voltage is stepped down for use in houses by small transformers, these having fewer turns of wire in the second coil. Currents are carried across country at very high voltages, along city streets at lower voltages, and into houses usually, usually at 110 volts. Higher voltages in houses would be very dangerous. And as a demonstration, we have this. How is heat produced in circuits? And for your apparatus, you need 110 volt connectors, heating coil, lamp, two sockets, an AC meter, if available. And here are your directions. Connect the two sockets in series. That is, connect one socket by only one wire to the other, and connect each socket to wires leading to the 110 volt outlet. Screw the coil into one socket, the lamp into the other, and plug them in. Cautiously fill the heating coil with the hand. Hold a piece of paper against it. Unscrew the coil and screw it back. Observe the lamp. Pull the plug from the outlet. Connect the sockets in parallel. Again, plug them in and test them, but keep hands off the coil. Test with paper. Unscrew the lamp and screw it back into the circuit. If a suitable ammeter is available, Measure the amount of current used by the coal, the lamp, the two in series, and the two in parallel. Observations. Does the series circuit provide enough current to heat the coal, the lamp, 
Can you turn off one device in a series current and have the other continue working? Does the parallel circuit provide enough current for both devices? Does the current supplied to one depend upon the current used by the other? Do devices in series use more or less current than each one alone? And for conclusions, what factors determine how much current flows through a circuit? So here you have parallel, where you can see the heat coming off the coal. And in a series, there's no heat. You can see the difference in the wires, and there's no heat. So there's going to be heat coming off here and here, but there's when the appliances are in series, the resistances are added, and when in parallel, each provides a pathway from one wire to the other. Number six, electricity can produce chemical changes. You know that every change in matter depends upon a change in the amount of energy present. Since electricity is one of the most useful forms of energy, it is valuable for producing many chemical changes. Silver is plated by electricity. Because of the high price of silver, few of us can afford solid silver tableware. But we still can have very good silverware made of iron or steel plated with silver. The plating process is simple. It is just the reverse of the change which goes on in a cell. In the cell, chemical change produces free electrons to form a current, while in plating, free electrons change the chemicals. A tank is prepared by filling it with a solution of a silver salt, such as silver nitrate. A piece of silver is hung in the tank from a hanger. On another hanger are placed the iron knives, forks, spoons, or other articles to be plated. The piece of silver is connected to the positive post of a battery or dynamo, and the iron articles are connected to the negative post. So you can see the pieces here in the battery, and you have the negative and positive posts. And here is a plate of pure silver, and everything is immersed in silver nitrate solution. Silver may be plated because electric currents can produce chemical changes. Silver is deposited from the solution upon the tableware, and the solution is renewed by reacting with the bar of silver. In the solution, the silver nitrate breaks up into one group of atoms of silver carrying a positive charge and another group of atoms carrying a negative charge. Because unlike charges attract, the silver is attracted to the negatively charged iron articles and sticks to them. The other atoms attack the silver, forming more silver nitrate. The process is continued until enough silver has been deposited on the tableware. The tableware is then removed from the solution and polished. Most other plated metal used today is similarly treated. Tin cans are made of tin plated iron. Sheets of iron are run in long strips through tanks of chemicals, the tin being deposited by electricity from the chemicals on the iron. The tin plated iron is washed and run through hot rollers to make the tin shiny and it comes out ready to make into tin cans or other plated articles. Charging a storage battery is a chemical change. In order to renew a storage battery, it is charged. In your automobile, there is a small generator which makes current and constantly recharges the battery as the automobile runs. If more current is needed than is supplied to the battery by the generator, an additional charge must be given it at the service station. The plates of a storage battery are made of lead and of lead peroxide. The solution is sulfuric acid. The plates are kept apart by wood, glass, or rubber separators to keep them from touching. From this diagram, you can learn the parts of a storage battery. Up here at the very top, we have the vent plug in the post. This is the intercell connector in the cover. This is a positive strap. And over here on this side is the negative strap. This is the splash cover. Down here is the positive plate. This is the partition. This is the separator. This is the negative plate. This is the container. And this at the bottom is the rib. When a storage battery produces a current, some of the acid is used up as it reacts with the lead peroxide. In order to recharge the battery, the chemicals must be restored. 
Running a current into the battery reverses the action that goes on when the cell produces current. The acid materials go back into the solution and the plates become lead peroxide again. You can make a little storage battery by putting two lead plates in a 10% solution of sulfuric acid. Connect the plates to several dry cells in series and let them stand. You will note that bubbles rise from them, and if you touch these bubbles with a flame, some of them will explode. Gradually, one of the plates becomes brown from the lead peroxide formed. If you connect this lead plate cell to a doorbell, after charging the cell for some time, it will ring the bell. In charging a battery, it is important to do it slowly. The garage's quick charging device does charge the battery, but it works so fast that the battery overheats. Large bubbles break up the coating of the plates and the battery wears out too fast. A slow charge permits the chemicals formed to stick on the plates where they belong. Chemicals are purified by electricity. Three of our most important metals, copper, aluminum, and magnesium, are prepared by use of electricity. The simplest of these methods is used in purifying copper. The copper that comes from blast furnaces is formed into sheets. It is full of impurities. These sheets of copper are put into a tank of copper sulfate solution and connected to the positive pole of a battery or dynamo. A plate of pure copper is suspended in the tank and attached to the negative pole. Copper from the impure copper sheets goes into solution as positively charged atoms which move across the negatively charged plate of pure copper because unlike charges attract. The impurities fall to the bottom of the tank. Aluminum and magnesium are extracted from their ores and purified at the same time. Both are prepared by electricity. Why are these metals often made in a region with abundant water power? Many chemicals are prepared by electricity. Many of our common chemicals are prepared by electrical means. Common table salt, sodium chloride, is the source of li and chlorine as well as, as well as of hydrochloric acid. A current can be used to separate the sodium from the chlorine and the two materials can be collected separately. If the salt is dissolved in water, the sodium acts on the water to form a lye solution. You have already seen water separated into hydrogen and oxygen by use of an electric current. The hydrogen, with its positive charge, was attracted to the negative connection of the dry cells, while the negatively charged oxygen was attracted to the positive post of the cell. And we have a demonstration. How can we produce chemical changes by electricity? And for your apparatus, you will need dry cells, copper strip, lead strip, pint jar or a large beaker, copper sulfate, connectors, sulfuric acid, two lead strips, and a doorbell. And here are the directions. Clean the lead strip with a knife or sandpaper. Make a saturated solution of copper sulfate. An easy way to do this is to throw a large handful of crystals into a glass of water and let it stand overnight. Heating the water will speed the dissolving. Connect the lead strip to the negative post and the copper strip to the positive post and put them into the solution. Observe the change taking place every few seconds at first and then every few minutes. Make a lead plate storage cell as described in the text. Be sure to pour the acid into the water, not water into the acid. Use it to ring the doorbell. Observations. What evidence did you see that chemical changes had taken place? Why did the metal deposit on the negative connection? Which plate was changed when the storage cell was charged? Was the copper plating firmly stuck to the lead? Conclusions. State as many principles as you can which might apply to this demonstration and show how they reply, or how they apply. And here we have a picture. Down the mountainside in four huge pipes comes part of the water supply of San Francisco. The force of the water generates 100,000 horsepower of electricity. Wow, that's cool. And this is a picture from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. It's pretty cool. That's going to about do it for today. This is the end of this chapter. 
Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you again soon.